All right, you're there in 2 Timothy chapter 3. I want you to focus in on that very famous verse there, starting in verse number 16, where the Bible says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now, the subject matter for my sermon tonight is going to be uh, on receiving correction from the Bible. And we need to be able to receive correction in order to grow, in order to continue moving forward. And especially in a church like ours, you're going to hear a lot of preaching on sin. You're going to hear different topics and different sermons that some of which might step on your toes a little bit, some of which might make you uncomfortable. Some things at first glance might offend you. But you need to decide First of all, if what you're hearing is the truth, is it from the Word of God? Is it right? If it is, then you need to decide how you're going to receive that. And you can either close up, bristle up, heart, stiffen your neck, and just reject, or you could humble yourself Get right and just accept the Word of God for what it says. And this is extremely important. This is an, a very important doctrine to understand and to learn because this literally, people not getting this and not being right about this gets people out of church to never want to come back because they hear something that offends them and they're out because they don't know how to receive correction. Nobody enjoys receiving correction, at least at first. But hopefully, if you're right, and if your spirit's right, I'm going to prove this to you from Scripture, you will enjoy receiving correction because the whole point, when you're corrected, that implies that you're in error, that you're wrong about something. I don't know about you, but I always want to know when I'm doing something wrong so that I can do it right the next time. So next time I don't have to keep making the same mistakes. I don't want to live my life making God angry with the things that I do just because I'm ignorant of it. I've never heard it or I don't know what's going on. I want to know is what I'm doing pleasing the Lord or not? Am I doing something wrong? I just want to know about it. Now it might, you know, not feel that great to hear you're doing this all wrong, right? That might be disappointing. It might, it might, it, you're going to feel bad about it. You might feel sad. You might get a little angry. Like, what do you mean? But at the end of the day, if what's being taught is right, if, if you are wrong about something, you need correction, we need to all be able to just receive that correction and move forward with it. The Bible says here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says all scripture. So the Bible itself, the word of God it's given by inspiration of God, and this is all profitable for us, not only for doctrine, which is what the first thing it says. Of course, we need to learn just good doctrine from Scripture. It says, but for reproof. Reproof is being told that you're wrong about something. So it's very profitable for us to receive the Word of God in order to tell us that we're wrong. For correction, to get it right, <laughs> to tell you this is the right. You're doing this wrong. Here's how you do it right for instruction in righteousness. The Bible is going to give us all of those answers. And it says that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. We ought to strive to be perfect. Now, we know we're never going to be sinless, at least not while we're in this flesh. But that doesn't mean that we just say, oh, well, forget it all then. I'm just going to go off into sin. I mean, that's ridiculous. Just because you can't get to the actual sinless perfection state while you're in this flesh doesn't mean you don't work towards that goal, towards that mark of being able to do everything as best as you possibly can. Um, turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter number 8. There's two aspects of receiving correction that I want to get into this evening. One of them has to do with just being chastened. When you get into sin, when you start doing things that are sinfully wrong, 
as a believer, as a child of God, you can expect to be chastened. And that is one way of correction. Sometimes we need to be corrected because you've gotten off the path and you may not even realize it. And sometimes when people get off in a sense, sometimes they realize what they're doing is wrong and then that's, that's even worse when you're just willfully sinning. But sometimes people just kind of lose focus a little bit and aren't really fully aware that they're getting off into areas that they shouldn't be going. I mean, this happens. And we all got to kind of do our best to make sure we're, we're, we're staying on that right path. But when you start veering off and you start getting into sin, that's when the Father's going to step in and chasten you and discipline you, punish you. And we need to be able to receive that disciplining, again, with a humble attitude and a humble spirit. There's two ways that a child can respond when they're being punished, when they're being chastened, when they're being disciplined. One is to maybe cry, say they're sorry, and, you know, I'm not going to do that again, Dad. Right? That would be the right way to receive their disciplining. The wrong way is to double down on their actions and just say, well, I'm just going to do it again. Or as soon as he's done with this, I'm going to go back behind his back and try to be sneaky about it or whatever and just try not to get caught, right? There's two different attitudes that you can have after you've been chastened. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 5. The Bible says, Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore, thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. So knowing that God is going to chasten us the same way that a father would chasten their own son, for that very reason, we need to make sure that we keep God's commandments. Don't break his rules. Don't do anything to make God angry, that, that we're going to transgress God's law. It makes, it, it, I mean, it just makes perfect sense. It's very simple. And the Bible is likening being chastened by God unto disciplining children. Now, turn to Proverbs chapter 13 because we, we, I, I like bringing this up, especially in today's society. It just needs to be, I think, thrown out there more than it needed to be 50 years ago or 100 years ago on, on rearing children. And this is just one more reason why it's so important to discipline our children right. The Bible is likening a father disciplining his son or chastening his son to God chastening us. When you start changing the methods of disciplining your children based on what the culture is saying around you instead of what God's word says, you're not going to fully understand the chastening of the Lord when it comes. Because I'll tell you what, God doesn't change his discipline measures to what the psychologists of today are going to say. God doesn't have a time out for you when you get off into sin. That's not the way that God is going to chasten you. Amen. And look, and, and you know, it sounds kind of funny, but this is important. Because when God puts a smackdown on your life, because you're doing something wrong, you're doing things you shouldn't be, you can't act all surprised about it. You need to understand, I'm receiving what I ought to receive because, you know, I, I did wrong. I got off into sin the same way that it's not some shock to my children when, when I paddle their rear. They know what they do and they can fully expect it, especially the older ones at this point in their life. They, they know exactly what's going to happen. Now, it doesn't make it any <laughs> any more or any less painful, right? But they at least know what to expect and it's, it's not just totally catching them off guard to where it's like, what are you doing? Like if I never, if I never disciplined my child correctly and then just started doing it, and, and this is part of the problem with people who don't start off with their children from a younger age because then it is just like, well, what are you doing? And that causes, that could cause more problems. It's harder to, to institute those changes. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but I mean, of course we should follow the Bible. And if, if you didn't do it from, the, from early on, 
It's time to just start where you need to start, but the problem is it's, it gets harder to um, get the proper response from the discipline when you don't start early enough. Um, Proverbs chapter 13, verse number 24, the Bible says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Betimes just means early. There's three passages that we're going to look at in Proverbs that all have to deal with physically raising your children and how you discipline your children specifically, how you chasten them. This verse says if you spare your rod, what is the rod used for? The rod's used for paddling. The rod is used for inflicting pain in the padded area of your skin, that, that, of your body, that, that is meant for receiving instruction. And if you, the Bible says, look, and I didn't make up, this isn't my words, this is God's words. If you spare your rod, he says you hate your son. I could almost guarantee you every single parent today that doesn't spank their child, that doesn't use a rod, will tell you, I love my children. I love my child. Of course they will. But what does God's word say? You know why? Because love is not just a feeling or an emotion. Yeah, it's not just about the connection you feel with your child. I'm sure people have bonds with their children. The reason why the Bible is using the language to say you hate your child is because you're not raising them correctly when you're not using the rod. You simply are not using what, you know, the, you're not going to get the right outcome or the right impact that needs to be there. Let's look at Proverbs 19. Because sometimes the right thing is not very pleasant to do and it's not something you want to do, but it's something you need to do. So the things that are necessary aren't always pleasant. I, I don't like, no, no, I don't think any parent likes watching their child cry or watching their child cry because They've been hurt or they, they've got some pain. You don't, it's not something that you just enjoy. Ha <laughs> ha, yeah, I really love seeing that. I mean, you'd be weird and, and demented, but I'll tell you what, it's necessary for a child to experience that type of a pain when they do something wrong. Now, we're not talking about injuring your child. We're not talking about slugging them in the face and breaking their bones and giving them, yeah, that's abuse. Because that is what no normal person would even consider. But unfortunately, you've got to say these things because people want to take your words out of context or, or come up with all kinds of weird ideas. We're talking about normal discipline and punishment, something that used to be normal for millennia, centuries, I mean, for a long time, even in this country. It's just the way things have been done. And I know at least here in the South, right, things are still done that way, I think, more than they, they are in, in a lot of other liberal places. People still using the switch, <laughs> right? Yeah. Amen and amen, because you know what? That's following biblical principles. It's what the, not just principles, it's what the Bible says. Proverbs 19, 18, chasten thy son while there is hope and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Don't hold back. Don't spare. Don't say, oh, well, they're crying. Now I'm not going to discipline them the way I ought to. Why? Because it's needful. They need to experience that in order for it to sink in the consequence for their actions. The last thing you want is your child to grow up thinking that either there's no consequences or they're really not that bad when you just are rebellious and disobey the godly authority in your life. And the godly authority in the parent's life is their, in the, in the ch children's life is their parents. The, chi the child's godly authority, God-given authority is their parents. And when they start rebelling against their parents, that's wicked and that needs to be taught to them through a means that, that God has designed human beings to understand by inflicting some level of pain 
for them to understand. And if you turn to Proverbs 23, we're going to see the import of this type of disciplining and correction or chastening as the Bible word would be. All of them are Bible words. Proverbs 23, verse 13, the Bible says, withhold not correction from the child. Now it's going to define what is that correction? For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. So remember in Proverbs 13, 24, he that spareth his rod hateth his son. Now we know what the rod was being used for. It's for beating, your, beating him with the rod. He shall not die. You're not going to kill him. You better not. I mean, you're definitely doing it wrong. <laughs> thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. That sounds pretty important. That sounds like something I don't want to leave out of my parenting because it's not pleasant. Because, because it makes everybody uncomfortable. I don't know about you, but I'd rather make the whole world uncomfortable and deliver my child's soul from hell than make everybody else comfortable and, and not give the appropriate discipline or chastening. You say, Pastor Rivers, why, why does it say they're going to deliver his soul from hell just by beating him with a rod? Because it goes down to the consequences for your actions, the understanding down at our just base level as a human being, just, just basic concept of understanding right from wrong. When you do wrong, you can expect pain as a result. That correlation of those two things. We have people today that don't even believe hell is a real place. If you don't even believe hell is a real place, if you don't believe that there's a judgment in the afterlife based on what you've done in this life, then what do you need a savior for? And if you don't need a savior, guess what's going to happen? Their soul's going to hell. If you think you don't need a savior, regardless of whether they believe the place is real, they're going to get a rude awakening when they lift up their eyes being in torments. But if from a child they understand the concept that, yeah, when I do wrong, it hurts. When I do wrong, there's pain associated with that. It's not that hard to understand the way that the world works and the way that God works. That when I do things that are sins, there is a punishment associated with that. It, it, it just makes perfect sense. It's going to be a lot easier for people to accept that, to understand that. That's why it's so important. And the reason why I'm bringing all this up because we're going to get into more just receiving correction. The Bible is pointing to the way that a father chastens his son is what we can expect from our Heavenly Father. So if the Bible is saying, thou shalt beat him with a rod and don't spare for his crying and you know this is what you need to do, then guess what you can expect when you start getting off into sin and God has to discipline you. When God has to chasten you, it's not going to feel good at all. There's probably going to be some tears. It's not something that you're going to want to go through. Turn to um, Proverbs chapter 3. And at least if you understand as a son or as a daughter what you're getting yourself, what, what's going to happen, then hopefully you can receive that correction the right way. And not get bitter about it, not get angry about it. Because, I mean, a a again, the illustration with kids, sometimes you have a child that'll get bitter and angry about being punished and being disciplined. And as a parent, you just know that they are going to get punished again probably really soon. <laughs> Because it didn't take that. I mean, even if they stop their behavior or whatever, but if they have a bad attitude about receiving that punishment, it doesn't take very long for them to need more correction. Because the point of the correction has to do more with their attitude. It's an attitude adjustment that needs to take place. And it's the same way with us in our sin. When we go, you know, we could get off into sin and God can punish us. 
But if we don't get that sin right and confess and forsake and just, and, you know, and repent and be sorrowful and just say, God, you know, I'm done with that. You know, you may just receive the punishment at that time. You can stop doing it for a time or whatever just because, you know, but if you, if you have a wrong attitude and you're just kind of bitter and you despise God correcting you for what you've done, the chastening isn't going to stop. It doesn't stop until you get your attitude right. And in Proverbs 3, verse 11, the Bible says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. We can actually take comfort as funny as it may sound, when you get disciplined by God, when you have to face that correction, when you have things happen that you'd rather not happen that might cause some tears as a result of your actions, at least you know that God loves you. My children can know that I love them because I'm not going to spare the rod. When they need it, then that's what they're going to get. And that's one way to know whether or not they love them. Because the reason why most parents want to spare the rod is because it's inconvenient. You don't have to stop what you're doing. Whatever, you know, you, you could be, it's always you're in the middle of doing something else. That's how they get in trouble in the first place, usually. Because <laughs> they're, they're, they're off getting into mischief somewhere. And then you got to stop everything in order to administer the punishment. And it's inconvenient. But it's necessary. And if you love them, you're going to take the time to stop. Okay, well, we got to deal with this now. All right. Now I'm going to go back. But, but you, you, know, you, need, you need to make that level of commitment. And you know what? God's willing to do that for us. He will do that. The person that's left to themselves and never has any punishment or consequence for actions, they're not, they, nobody loves that person. Seriously. If you're just, if, if there's no, if, if a child is left to just do whatever you want, the parents don't love, whoever's letting that child just do whatever they want, they don't love them because that child's going to grow up to be a monster. I don't know if I brought this story up before. I had a friend growing up. Um, I knew him in grammar school, through high school, and um, what a pretty good friend of mine. He had a brother that was like a firefighter and he had other people that, that knew in our, in our community, like his family was known. So like the police and, and, and other people knew him. And as he got older, you know, as a teenager, as in high school, you know, we all got into a little bit of trouble. But he kind of kept going on and on and on and on. And I remember one night specifically, he, like, he got pulled over for drunk driving three times in the same night. Three times. And because they knew his family, because everything, you know, they just kept bringing him home and he'd go get out again and go back, you know. And it was like this for years where there's just no real consequence for, for his actions. And guess what happened? He got worse and worse and worse. Started smoking crack, just doing all, you know, just, just went down that downward path to the point where even his friends are just like, look, man, we're, you know, we try to help out. You don't want help. We got to cut you off because, you know, you're self-destructing. You're not bringing us down with you. But um, that, was, that was all a result. I mean, he, he hit rock bottom and probably even below. Thankfully, he's still alive. I don't really know exactly what he's doing now, but... It's a result, it's a good reminder whenever, you know, of what happens when there's just no consequences for you to do. You just get worse and worse and worse. And, that, and that's the way it works. And, and people that dropped them off at home might have thought they were doing them a favor by keeping them out of trouble, right? They, oh, you're not, you're out of trouble with the law or whatever. That actually didn't help him at all. He actually needed to just be locked up or whatever, disciplined. He, what he really needed was a rod. Yeah. That's what he really needed. And that's why even in, in, in a lot of biblical punishment was you get the rod for the fool's back. Yeah. That's what he needed. 
but he didn't ever get it. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. You want to make sure that when you do, not just if, when, because everybody screws up. Just like every child has to receive correction, every child of God needs to receive correction. Because the Bible says that God scourges every son whom he receives. Every son, every child. So we need to make sure that we can take the correction appropriately and know that it will come, but know that God loves us. And that's why he's doing it. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number five. The Bible reads, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. There is that verse. He's going to discipline you if he loves you. If he doesn't love you, then you're not going to receive disciplining. The same principle taught in Proverbs with your own children. He scourges every son whom he receiveth. Verse number seven, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. You know what? If you're just getting away with sin and nothing ever happens and you could just keep living your life and sinning and sinning and not... And at that point, I, you know, I would be checking my own salvation. Now, obviously, we know that God's timing isn't always just immediate, right? You can do some sins and it's not going to come back for a little while, but there is going to be disciplining and chastening involved. And if you can just be living and living and living and just nagging anything, I'd be like, am I a bastard? Because I ought to be being chastened by the Lord. And that's exactly what this passage is saying here, too. You know, you're, you're, if you don't get any chastisement, if you're not being punished, you're just some bastard child that's not, that's not, doesn't have a loving father that's disciplining him. Verse number nine, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? And again, you know, the, this, this correlation just continues to come back of just associating the way that you raise children on this earth and the way that God deals with us as children. I mean, it's, it, the two go hand in hand, which is, again, the reason why I brought up in depth how we discipline children or how we ought to be according to the Bible. Because if the Bible is going to be using one as an example, we ought to understand that example to relate it to the way that God's going to deal with us. Verse number nine, uh, verse number 10, excuse me. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. The whole point of us being disciplined, it's for our benefit. It's to teach us, hey, you're doing wrong, but to be partakers of his holiness means to get the sin out of your life, to be more holy because you're being corrected for what you've done that's wrong. Verse 11, now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Of course it's not joyous when God lays a smackdown on you for what you've done that's wrong. It's not going to be pleasant. If it was pleasant, then it wouldn't be chastening. It wouldn't be punishment. But just know that the, the going through that is going to be better for you. And I'll tell you what, just from experience, every single one of my children have gone through receiving the rod and they're all better for it. They're all way better off for it. Guaranteed. There's not, well, I've heard people say, oh, it didn't work. Well, spanking doesn't work with my child. You know, you're not doing it right. You're not doing it right. The Bible's not giving any exceptions. Well, if the rod's not working, then spare it and use this other method. It doesn't say that. It says, if you spare the rod, you hate your child. Now, there are some children that are more stubborn than others, and they need to receive a little bit more correction than others do. Yeah, we've gone through that before. 
but your resolve has to be stronger than a child's. As a parent, can, can you do that? Can you dedicate yourself to being a little bit more stubborn than your child? You have to be. If you're going to raise them right, you have to be. You have to be willing every single time not to spare the rod because eventually if they know dad's not going to crack, he ain't going to break. Because they want to push the boundaries. They want to know what the limits are. They want to know, can I push it and push it and push it and then it'll finally give in and then I can just get my way or is it just going to be a brick wall? And I'll tell you what, God's not going to budge. If you're going to, do, if you're going to sin and just get off and, and, and be a bad child, you can receive discipline and chastening every single time. Don't try to butt heads with God. And likewise, we ought to be as parents the same way when we're raising our children. They ought to just know very clearly what to expect. And it's not because you hate them. It's rather the exact opposite, because you love them. Verse number 12, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Um, turn to Psalm 94. Actually, no, turn, just turn to Revelation chapter 3. Turn to Revelation 3. I'll read Psalm 94 for you. A lot of these things are just similar concepts just found in multiple places in Scripture. Psalm 94, 12 says, Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law, that thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. For the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance. And I'll read that again. Because the Bible's saying that, Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord. Whom God chastens, you're actually blessed. It's actually a good thing to be chastened of the Lord and teachest him out of thy law. If God's going to take the time to discipline you and punish you and then teach you out of his law, why is, it, why is that a blessing? It says that thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity. Receiving the disciplining now gives you rest in the future. You will enter into his rest, just like the Bible is talking about saving a soul from hell. It says, until the pit be digged for the wicked, for the Lord will not cast off his people. Why is it a blessing to be chastened with God? Because you are a child of God. And as a child of God, you won't be cast off. You won't be forsaken, neither will he forsake his inheritance. You get the, the, the benefit or the luxury of being a child and being an, an heir and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 3, we're going to look, start reading in verse number 14 on the, uh, the message to the church of Laodicea. The Bible says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. This is exactly the same attitude I was saying that oftentimes that we might be able to fall into where you kind of stray off the path and you don't even realize you know, necessarily that you're getting off into sin or you're getting off into an area where you need to be corrected, rebuked, told you're wrong, and get back on the right path. Oftentimes, you could just start veering slowly off the wrong direction until you find yourself way farther away than you ever even realized you were. And this is what happened with the church in Laodicea because what were they saying? We're rich. We're increased with goods. We have no need of anything. We must be doing things well. We're prospering. Everything's great. What could go wrong? We're enjoying our church every week. You know, it's a great time. We're all in good health and good wealth and great. We're, everything's going really well. What could be wrong? Well, this is where the rebuke comes in from the Lord saying, And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You think everything's great and God just like, no, no, no. You've got it all wrong and backwards. You're miserable, wretched, poor, blind, naked. 
I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. I say, I, I, I love you as many as I love. I'm going to rebuke and chasten. Rebuke means you're told you're wrong, and then the chastening is the punishment part. Chastening isn't very good without the rebuke because you need to know what you did wrong. But then the, the correct response is to be zealous. Let that light the fire under you, right? Because you're probably feeling the fire under you already. Let that light the fire under you to get right and to repent. I don't want to deal with that again. I'm going to get right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, God, I'll do it. That's the chastening aspect of receiving correction, right? We ought to have a good attitude and not, and not have it take us by surprise when something bad happens in your life because you got off into sin. Don't use that to blame God or have a bad attitude or just despise the chastening. Say, well, take it patiently. I did wrong. This is what I can expect. And, and you know what? Even before you do wrong, just knowing that might help you not to do wrong. I know as a child of God, I, you know, don't get caught up just because we preach the gospel and tell people salvation's not of your works. Hey, we know that. We believe that. Amen. But don't let that get your own thinking lopsided into thinking that, well, there's no consequence for my sin because I'm already saved. Wrong. Dead wrong. Well, it's okay. I mean, I'm saved. No, it's not okay. No, it's not. And, you know, people who teach that it is or oh, we're free in grace, they're wrong. That's wicked. That's not right. And though the people like that are the reason why so many people don't even want to believe that salvation could be so simple because that doesn't even make any sense. I don't know how many times I've had people say, so you think you can just do whatever you want and that's just okay? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. We're saying that God saves you by his grace through faith, not by anything that you do. However, once you're saved... God expects you to live a certain way, and if you don't, you will receive a punishment. It's just not hell. That's the key difference. So you can't just blow off your sin and just say, well, I'm saved, whatever. You don't have a proper fear of the Lord if that's the way your attitude is. And you better just don't be shocked if that is your attitude when God brings the chastening. Because as a child of God, he will chasten you. And when you have a flippant attitude about sin, you're all the more likely to get involved in it. So the chastening aspect is being punished for what you've done. A rebuke is being told you're wrong. Usually the rebuke comes first. The other point of being able to receive correction is being able to receive a rebuke. The chastening comes from God. You know, as a, as a pastor of a church or as a brother in Christ, like, I'm not going to chasten anyone else. That's God's job to chasten somebody. But we do have a job of administering rebukes when they're necessary. That is something that can fall to the brethren of being able to give someone else a rebuke. And in fact, we're commanded to do so in certain instances. Now, this doesn't mean that you get the magnifying glass out or the microscope and look into people's lives, every single detail. Okay, where are you sitting? You know, I'm going to straighten you out. No. Obviously, with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. Okay, and we need to take into consideration that nobody's perfect. However, however, at the same time, we don't want to suffer sin on our neighbor when you know that people are going down a bad path 
when you know someone's maybe getting off or getting involved in things that's going to just destroy them anyways, if you love that person, you're going to tell them, hey, you need to be corrected. You, you, you don't be dabbling in that stuff. Don't go off that way. It's not good for you. It's not right. Look at what the scripture says. And not everyone wants to hear it. I remember at Word of Truth, there was, you know, someone that started coming to church. He got saved and baptized. And he was telling me about this tattoo that he was going to get. Didn't know any better at the time. Now, I could have just kept my mouth shut, not said anything. But you know what? The Bible says that you're not supposed to print marks on your body. You're not supposed to have cuttings of the flesh. I'm not going to suffer sin upon that person. So you know what? I had to tell him, that's not right. You shouldn't do that. That's a rebuke. That's a reproof. And I use Scripture to do it, just like the opening verse we looked at. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And, and, and we use a, I use a Scripture, and obviously you do so tactfully. You're not trying to just, just attack someone when you're trying to instruct them. But I wouldn't love that person very much if I just knowingly let them just get into sin, even especially if they don't even know it's a sin. Now, it's up to them to decide what they're going to do with that. And in that situation, it didn't go well. He didn't receive the correction. And that's why I, think, uh, that's why I believe shortly thereafter, he just stopped coming to church. It's not because I treat, I mean, that's not some sin that gets you kicked out of church. It's just a foolish thing to do. It is a sin. But when you start having that attitude where you don't want to hear the truth anymore, you don't care about what it says, it's not going to take that much longer to then just, just get out the door because you don't want to hear it anyways. And unfortunately, that happens all too often. We need to be able to be accepting of rebuke. Turn to Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter number 9. The Bible says in verse number 8 of Proverbs 9, Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. If you are wise, and the flip side of that is if you're a wise person, if you want to be a wise man, when someone rebukes you, love that person. So why would I love someone who's telling me I'm wrong? Because they're looking out for you. Because they actually care. If someone's willing to give you a rebuke, think about it this way. They actually love you enough to be willing to sacrifice your friendship because you might get offended at what they say to try to help you be on the right path. That's someone who loves you. And you've got to be able to remember that and realize that if someone's willing to tell you you're wrong about this, they're will, you know, they understand the con everyone understands the consequences when you tell someone something that they might not receive very well. I mean, this is the reason why so many people don't even want to give the gospel to friends or family or loved ones because they're worried that when you bring it up, they're not going to want have anything to do with you anymore. But if you have that type of an attitude, you know what that tells me? You don't love that person. Because if you're not going to warn them about the destruction to come, how could you say that you love them? You care more about not hurting their feelings than you do about their soul. And in a similar way, when you see someone, they're going to go down some sinful path. Well, you know what? The Bible teaches us about going down sinful paths. It's not going to end up good for you. If you love that person, you ought to be able to correct them. Give them the rebuke they need. Someone starts getting involved in drinking or even, I mean, these days especially, you know, uh, the, the prescription drugs. And it's easy to start just, you know, it's accepted. Well, I've got a prescription for it. My doctor said it's okay. Everyone thinks, you know, and it could just go further and further. You get a dependency and now all of a sudden you're hooked. Sometimes, I mean, people just need to be warned. I'm not saying it's always a sin or it's always wrong 
to have some types of medication. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying all prescription drugs are wrong. I'm not, I'm not saying that either, but you all know what I'm talking about, that there is a lot of huge over prescription, especially in pain medication and things like that, where people grow dependent and it's, they might as well just be on some street drug because it's still impacting your brain and you're still just getting high off of whatever legal drug some doctor wants to give you. Yep. And that is just as worthy of rebuke. Why? Because if you stay on it, it's going to destroy you. Just like if you go down the path of, of alcohol or any other drugs. You, go, you, you get on that path, it's going to destroy you. So out of love, you rebuke someone. That's why Proverbs 9, 8 says, rebuke, re, Reprove not scorn unless you hate thee. Rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. Flip over to chapter 17. If you're wise, you'll love the person that wants to correct you. And I'll even go this far, is I'll love the person that wants to correct me even if the person that's wanting to correct me is wrong. Even if they're wrong. Because it still speaks a lot about what they are trying to do by trying to correct you. Now, I know there's always some people who are just more interested in, in lifting themselves up to, you know, by tearing other people down. I'm not talking about, about those people, but that's usually heretics or other people anyways. It's not going to be someone. You're, you're typically not going to find that person within the church. Definitely not within our church, but um, obviously you use your judgment in that. But even if someone was incorrect, but if they're sincere in their belief, I'm going to love that person because I know that they actually care about me. Proverbs 17, verse number 10, the Bible says, A reproof entereth more into a wise man than in hundred stripes into a fool. See, the fool has to keep on receiving the chastening, but they never accept the reproof. They're told they're wrong, and then the chastening comes to reinforce the reproof but the fool just never accepts the reproof. The wise man is going to accept the reproof without even needing the chastening to follow it up and to drive the point home. The fool just never gets it. So let's start by accepting the reproof and hoping that the chastening is never even necessary to just get it right the first time. I mean, with my kids, often, I mean, depending on the severity of whatever they do wrong, if they do something that they didn't even realize was wrong, I'm going to tell them, hey, that's wrong. Don't do that. And I'm not going to discipline or punish them for it, especially when they just don't even know. They're just ignorant of it. Okay, just don't do that again. Now, if they do it again, obviously they're going to get chastened. And they're going to keep on being told they're wrong and chastened until they realize, hey, I shouldn't do this. But um, one more place. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Verse number 5. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 5 says, It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. You say, I don't like that guy. He told me I was wrong. He told me I shouldn't be watching this or listening to that. I don't like that guy. Well, it's better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. Yeah, the, you know what? The song sounds great, right? It tickles your ears. The song of the world, the song of fools. They're just all about vanity, things that don't really matter. People who want to surround themselves just with hearing fluff. And no one's ever offended, and it just makes me feel good, and I just want, that's what I want to hear. Well, the Bible says it's better for you to hear the rebuke of the wise. Because the person that has wisdom, they're not, they don't want to suffer that upon you. They, they know the end of whatever it is that they need to rebuke you for. And that's the reason why they rebuke you and warn you and give you correction. So how do we deal with rebuke? Turn to Leviticus chapter 19. We're almost done. Verse 
The instant reaction is usually just to get offended when someone rebukes you, especially, especially just another brother in Christ, a brother or sister in Christ, someone that's just your peer. Oftentimes we might, we might feel like, well, who are you? Who are you to tell me that what I'm doing is wrong? Right? That's a natural, a natural reaction to have. It's kind of a fleshly reaction to have, but it's natural to be like, well, pff, well who do you... Who? Because we typically have a good view of ourselves, right? Most people think that I'm doing everything right. That's all the more reason why we need to be told we're wrong sometimes. Because nobody's doing everything right. And the longer you think you're just perfect, <laughs> the, the more lifted up in pride you're going to be. But, um, you know, and sometimes people get bitter and I don't want to talk to that person. I don't like that person. Who are you to judge? You know, you just mind your own business, etc. And that may be the case sometimes where people ought to mind their own business. You know, like I said, with the nitpicking and stuff. But if you have the right attitude in general about receiving rebuke, then it shouldn't matter even if they should mind their own business. Just stay humble. Just say, well, maybe I'm not perfect. You know, it's not always right to just be nitpicking people, but you know what, if they do, if you've got the right attitude, it shouldn't really matter. Don't let it bother you. You don't have to get offended that someone thinks you're doing something wrong. There's no reason to get offended at that. I do my best to try not to get offended. I mean, and the more, especially when you get titles, they're like, oh, well, you're a pastor and everything else. People can say some very offensive things, but you got to try not to get offended. You're like, oh, well, pff, haven't you read? Like, it's, well, yeah, no, I haven't read that in the Bible. I pastor a church, but I haven't read that verse. <laughs> right? Like, see, but when you start having that type of a mindset and attitude, then it's already just shut down. Maybe there is an area, and, and some, then the person doing rebuking isn't doing a very good job at it, and maybe someone isn't being respectful, but maybe they have a point. And I could just totally miss that if I'm just shutting down immediately just because I'm like, have my own attitude. Well, who are you? Well, who do you think you are? Right? And we could all apply that to yourself. If you're rebuked, consider who is rebuking you. Is it a brother in Christ? Look at Leviticus 19, verse number 17. The Bible says, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. So don't hate your brother, colon, Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. This is part of God's law. He's saying don't hate them, because if you hate them, you're not going to, you're going to allow sin to just take over their life. But if you love them, you're going to tell them that they're, what they're doing is wrong. Verse 18, Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. That's, that's Old Testament for you. Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus, what, you know, modern Christianity wants to stay away from Leviticus. And here we find, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself in Leviticus. Because it's always been part of God's word. But we also have to understand what that means. In the context here, this is talking about rebuking your neighbor. Telling them that they're wrong about something out of love. Not just being all fluffed. Is he, today's Christianity is going to say, oh, well, love, love your neighbor as yourself just means love, 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 love. And you can't say anything wrong. You can't say anything's a sin. You can't say anyone's doing anything wrong because we just love everybody. That's not love. That's hate. When you can't tell someone that what they're doing is wrong and they're wrong, that's hate. Love is telling them that they're, what they're doing is wrong and not suffering sin upon them, as the Bible says. Proverbs 27.5 says, Open rebuke is better than secret love. It's better, it's better for someone to rebuke you publicly and just be out in the open about it than it is for someone that loves you but it's love and secret. You don't even know. I'd much rather just have someone come out and rebuke me. In Proverbs 28, 23, I'm going to close on this verse. 
The Bible says, He that rebuketh a man afterwards shall find more favor than he that flattereth with the tongue. So he can't be afraid to rebuke someone when it's needed. So this is comparing someone who gives a rebuke with someone who flatters. Right? On the surface or right up at front, the person who flatters might be the one you want to gravitate to because right off the front, it's going to be like, oh, wow, this person really likes me and they're saying all these things I want to hear. But the Bible explains that the flatterer is just setting a trap for you. They've got ill will towards you anyways if they're just laying flatteries on you. That's part of their deceit. That's part of their trap. They don't love you in their heart. They actually hate you. But the person that rebukes you, they're not as worried about the instant gratification of, oh, I'm going to make this person smile right now. The flatterer is going to make, might make you smile immediately. But that's just surface level. That's vanity. That doesn't ultimately mean anything because they actually don't care about you. The person that rebukes you knows they're going to be heavy. That's not going to be something they want to hear necessarily, you know, but it's needful. And because I love them, I'm going to tell them that. And it says, he that rebukes a man afterwards shall find more favor. When things settle down and a person can just receive, yeah, you know what? I was wrong. That should make you love that person even more. Way more than the person that just tells you the light, fluffy things or flatters with their lips. Receiving correction, receiving rebuke, receiving chastening, it is vital to have this down in the Christian life. And if you can stay humble, then you shouldn't have a problem in this area. It's, it's when you're full of pride or when you just think, you know, the who are you or the, you know, I do everything right type of an attitude, you're going to need to then get, go through more chastening of the Lord. But let's avoid the chastening altogether and receive the re reproof, receive the rebuke, receive the correction. And I'm going to try my best in this church to preach on all the things that people need corrected in their life. And if you hear something from time to time that matches something that you're doing, don't think that I have it out for you or that I hate you and I'm trying to drive you out of the church. In fact, it's the opposite. If, there, if I do happen to know about something or some sin or some things where people are in error, I'm going to preach on it. And it's not because I'm coming after you. It's because God's word is profitable for the reproof, for the correction, for the instruction righteous. And I want all of us to be doing our best to be right with God. And if you, if you could receive that, it's going to make you that much stronger and you could at least know that you've got someone here that loves you and cares about you enough to tell you the truth and not just pat you on the back on your way to hell yeah. or on your way to destruction in this life. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all of the instruction that you give us. God, help us all to, to remain humble and ready and willing to receive your words, dear God. I know that there's a spirit here of people that, that do love you and want to serve you the best. We don't want to do things to make you angry. We want to be used by you to the utmost, dear Lord. We want to bring glory and honor unto the name of Jesus Christ. And we are here as your workmen, dear Lord. Help us to study your word, to be workmen that, that needeth not to be ashamed, but that we are approved, that we rightly divide the word of truth. And Lord, help us to have the strength and the courage to reprove and rebuke when it's appropriate, when it's necessary, dear Lord, and that we can do so um, not in hypocrisy either, but that we would um, consider one another and provoke one another into love and good works. And it's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen.